So previously, I gave an overview of the band theory of solids. That was simply an explanation that the energies available inside of a solid are split into conduction band, valence band, and an energy band gap in between uh, where energies are forbidden. Today, we're going to dive a little deeper and introduce the band theory of solids. To do that, I have some goals. First goal is really to understand the origin of why bands form. And so we're going to start just talking about silicon. If you look at the alpha-bow buildup of silicon, it's neon and two electrons in the 2S, 3S subshell and two electrons in the 3P subshell. You know, those two subshells are not at the same energy. They're split by spin-orbit coupling into two different energy levels. And so you might sketch just their energy levels like this. The three electrons that are in the 3S subshell are there and 3P are there. And that's for a silicon atom. Just one silicon atom all by its lonesome. Now, if I take two silicon atoms and move them close to each other, something interesting happens. So these are the energy levels as a function of how far apart these two atoms are from each other. As the atoms get closer and closer, they reach a point where you start to notice those energy levels split. So the 3P splits into two levels, the 3S splits into two levels. I can't say which one of these levels is the left atom and which one is the right atom. It's both atoms. These are the 3P uh, states and these are the 3S states for the system of two atoms. As I bring those atoms closer and closer together, I'll get to a point where 3P and 3S actually run into each other, and below which there's no distinguishing them. And as I keep making them even closer and closer together, other, other energy states are going to actually start to surface. And I'll get this banana shapes thing where I, where I just have these two, these two uh, states are possible. That's silicon, and we're going to understand why these splittings happen. Another thing that I want to accomplish right now is to understand just that conduction electrons are mobile and that uh, valence electrons are not. It doesn't take a whole lot of argument. It's very heuristic. You know, the valence electrons are stuck in the atoms. But we need, to, we need to be really clear on that. What moves in a semiconductor are the conduction electrons and the holes. Holes can move. And the movement of holes and the movement of conduction electrons are what give us the models we're going to develop for conduction through a semiconductor. A third goal for today is to interpret those energy band diagrams that you're going to see. This is not an energy band diagram, but we will get some, and we want to uh, be able to understand them. All right, so those, those are the goals in hand. I want to start off by reviewing a, um, a problem from quantum mechanics called the one-dimensional potential well. And it's similar to something that you may have seen the particle in a box, and you may have seen this, the one-dimensional potential well. They're very similar, except that the one-dimensional potential well is mathematically a, a messier, messier proposition. It actually comes out to have some very similar properties. You have a graph of potential energy versus position here. Potential energy of what? Oh, of an electron, for example. So an electron anywhere around here can have these potential energies. Between x equals 0 and b, it can actually have lower energies. And so you have a well. And if you have an electron with 2.5 electron volts of energy, you can actually toss it in this well, and it will be stuck in it. And it will stay right here at this level. And there are only discrete energy levels that are allowed, just like you saw with the particle in box state, if you ever looked at that problem. And so you only have these discrete energies allowed. And this is a hypothetical well that happens to have a depth of five and a half electron volts. And so these three states fit inside. And you notice as you get to higher levels, they get farther apart. It's a lot like the particle in box, which I'll remind you about right here. A uh, particle in a box is basically an infinite, well, is an infinite potential well. And so you have these energy levels that go as, first, the ground state is the lowest energy, and the next one it goes as n squared e. And so when n equals 2, it goes as 2 squared times the energy of the ground state. When n equals 3, it goes as 3 squared times the energy of the ground state. And then it goes 4, it goes as 4 squared, so on. So that's the, the particle in a, in a box that is an infinite potential well. So they're very similar. In fact, you, you notice uh, that the, 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 this almost is an n squared, but it's a little different. You get uh, a, a transcendental equation result there. I wanted to talk about this 
because I want to uh, po- I want to, to go into what happens when two quantum mechanical items get close to each other. So keeping with these potential wells, if I take these two finite potential wells and move them into close proximity of each other, and so I'll call A the distance between the left well and the right well. Back to our well model, that is uh, potential energy versus position, and then the allowed states in between, they do this when they come into proximity. And when these two wells are far apart, you just have those 2.8, 2.5, and 5 electron volt energy levels. But when those wells get closer together, those energy levels start to split. And you get one level that goes up and one level that goes down. It's not that one of these belongs to the left well and one belongs to the right well. They, these two energy levels belong to the system of two wells. And it becomes a more pronounced effect for the higher energy states. And so we'll just just look at them to to really make a sense of what this is all about. If I have two wells in proximity, there are two different characteristics of these split off states. One of them you call bonding and one you can call anti-bonding. And the reason why has to do entirely with energy. The energy minimum principle of physics says that systems always prefer the lowest possible energy. They always uh, strive to minimize energy, right? So if I bring two wells in close proximity with each other, if they follow this lower split off, then as the wells get closer and closer, the energy gets lower. That's favorable. Those two wells are going to be attracted to each other. But if I bring two wells into close proximity and they follow this uh, upper split off, then as they get closer and closer together, the energy goes up. That's energetically unfavorable, and those two wells will repel each other. And that's why it's called anti-bonding, as opposed to bonding, where they attract. And that that sounds like a, a chemical thing, because the same principle is used to explain chemical bonding. If instead of the left well and the right well, I put two atoms near each other. So here we have two atoms uh, with some separation. So when they're far apart, you know, you, you have your discrete subshells. And yes, let's talk about silicon, where you just have these, these shells that are filled, the 3S and 3P are two filled, uh, outermost filled subshells. As you bring these two silicon atoms closer together, you start to see a split off between the 3P subshell. The P subshell can hold six electrons. In silicon, look at the alpha buildup. There are two electrons per silicon atom in the 3P subshell, meaning that when two silicon atoms come close to each other, there are four 3P electrons. And there's so meaning there's plenty of room for them in this lower energy level, and they'll go there and you have bonding. And that's why silicon can form a solid. It can bond. You get these tetrahedral bonds between silicon atoms due to the 3P electrons. As a counter argument, helium. Uh, Helium has a filled 1S subshell. So imagine this is a 1S subshell instead of a 3P. So helium's got two electrons in a helium atom. And they fill up the the one S subshell. If you bring two helium atoms close to each other, there are four electrons. An S subshell can only, per the Pauli exclusion principle, hold two electrons. So of those four electrons, two of them go into uh, the lower one, but two of them go into the upper one, uh, which, by the way, splits off more. So two helium atoms close together are energetically unfavorable. Two atoms with filled the subshell are energetically unfavorable to be close to each other. So they don't form dimers. Uh, Helium doesn't. Silicon is just fine. Consider hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron in the one S subshell. So you bring two two hydrogens close to each other. uh, You can get two electrons in this bonding uh, split off per the Pauli principle. And so hydrogen forms H2 just fine. Let's consider more than two atoms. So here I pictured five, and I I don't know if I got the right number of lines in there or not, but when you have five, if you have five silicon atoms, they will uh, form additional splittings, you know, because now not just adjacent atoms are are, are coupled together, but non-adjacent atoms have a little bit of coupling. And so you end up with a lot of split offs all between here. So uh, when there are just two, these are the split offs. And when there are more than two, there are multiple split offs in between. 
uh, those outer two that uh, correspond to just two atoms. And this is an interesting thing. That's five. Suppose you had a solid, a bulk solid. So you have, you know, a 10 to the 20 some atoms, say 10 to the 21 atoms. If I had 10 to the 21 atoms, I'd have 10 to the 21 lines in here. That's a lot of lines in that space. This will essentially be then a continuum. In an actual macroscopic material, this is a continuum of states in this split off. That's a band. That is a continuous states, all of which can be occupied, none of which are assigned to a specific atom. There are the, there are states of the system, but each state can hold well. It's a, it's a p subshell for silicon that can hold six electrons. So you know there are, but there are a lot of states. So that's the band of, of silicon. Let's go back to the picture we started with, where uh, for silicon, where where we brought two silicon atoms closer and closer together, and then they split off. The 2S splits into bonding and antibonding, and the 3P splits into bonding and antibonding. Eventually, they get so close, uh, the, the 3P and the 3S mer merge together. But then, at some point, we get this, these additional bands forming. Now, the thing about the banana-shaped pair of, of lines is the effect they have together is to take the energy levels that would be here and push them out of the way. This thing is like a, a tusk that's been driven into the into the kill. And so there are no allowed energies inside of here. And so you have this band gap. And that's what that is. That is a band gap. This is the real lattice spacing at, for atoms in the, the silicon crystal. If the energy is down here, that, that belongs to an electron that's bound in the atoms. If the energy is up here, that belongs to an electron that is free to move. And if the energy is in here, it's forbidden. And that's your band gap. Let's say there are n uh, atoms in our particular sample of silicon. We'd say that it, the valence band has two n-fold degeneracy because you know, per, per the Pauli principle, you have two electrons in each uh, state. And this band degeneracy, not, not maybe the state degeneracy you've heard about, which is a, one, uh, multiple states that have the same energy. In this case, it, a band degeneracy is a bunch of states that uh, that fit into a band of energies and there are two is two unfold degenerate and the conduction band uh, it can will have have far fewer electrons available but lots of states if you have used the word degeneracy in a physics course before this this might be a slightly a different uh, take on that term uh, we'll leave this little section down here for you to, to look at is what i just said i think um except um most Bands are deep valence bands and don't contribute to semiconductivity. Uh, you know, so all of these, all, all of these energies down here are, are you know, what you call deep valence. And there are actually more bands down here, right? Because this is a 3S splitting off. You know, we haven't talked about the 2S and the 2P, but, but they're down here. And so you are forming more bands down here, but they are all valence. It's only way up here at the top of the alpha ball that you have conduction. Okay, when we come back, we're going to look at real band diagrams because what you see here is not a band diagram. A band diagram is a little different. It, it puts this in what you call case space. And we'll look at zero and one dimensional band diagrams, which are much more intuitive. And we'll do that next time.